Super. Thanks for letting everyone in, Karen. Of course. Good morning or e afternoon or evening, everyone. We'll get started in a moment. We'll just let a few more folks join. My name is Ellen Engseth, and I am one of your hosts today. Yes, feel free to turn on your camera. I think you have the option to do that, as well as to unmute yourself if you wish. That is super. But while we um, are meeting together and listening to our guest speaker, please unmute yourself or mute yourself for sound quality purposes. Thanks. Okay. Is everyone in? Yes. Super. Great. Well, I think we can get going in the interest of time. Um, good morning, everyone from Minnesota, which is Dakota land. Um, I'm in the middle northwest or north of the U.S. And um, I am pleased to welcome you to this event. Uh, Archival VISTA's briefings on behalf of the International Archival Affairs Section Steering Committee, and my co-chair of which is here with me today, Karen Trivet. So Karen, would you like to say hello? Hello. <laughs> Thank you. And um, we'll be glad to put um, a link to our section if you'd like to learn more about us. Um, and we are very, very pleased to have our guest speaker, Tamara and Stefanik, is that correct? Close enough. <laughs> you can instruct us, Tamara. Um, and uh, the topic today is a conversation about the Fulbright Scholars Program, what we often talk about as a Fulbright Award. And it came to us that many people in our field and related fields and our friends and colleagues would like to learn more about this. And I have met our guest speaker because of the collections that I work with and some shared uh, experiences and expertises. And I thought she might be a wonderful guest speaker for us. And um, I expect that'll be the case today. So thank you all for joining us particularly a big thank you to our guest speaker, who I will turn over to now. Thank you so much, Ellen. Hello, everybody. Good uh, afternoon from Zagreb. So we are on a different time zones. But, you know, I was thinking while I was preparing um, this talk, um, I see ourselves as colleagues primarily. So I'm just going to go a little bit on informal side of this because we are um, working with the same problems, but in different in different uh, countries, right? So um, mm, if I cough a little bit, I have a cold, I will just mute myself for, for a second or two. So don't, <laughs> don't think that I'm gone. I'm, uh, I will be still here. Uh, for a start, I will share my presentation. It worked like a minute ago. So it should be, let me see, there's F5, I don't have my glasses on. Okay, mm -hmm. just a second. Mm -hmm. For some reason, F5 doesn't work. Oh, do, can you see it? It's on the full screen now, right? Okay, excellent. So <coughs> Ellen asked me to talk about my experience as a Fulbright visiting scholar. I was in uh, Los Angeles at UCLA until the April of this year. So this is quite a uh, Still fresh memories, right? So, uh, but I still don't have uh, all the data that I gathered. I, I still haven't prepared all the publications that I said I would. So, uh, this is still on uh, on the rough side, I would say. Um, so today, uh, I would just like to talk why I applied for research scholarship. How did this whole process went? Because I really like to inspire all of you just to try, you know, because if you don't try, <laughs> there's a good chance that nothing will happen, right? Um, what was my research and teaching project uh, about? And some of my impressions about the uh, differences of uh, United States archival cu culture and Croatian culture, meaning 
Croatia is situated in the middle of Europe, east, middle of Eastern Europe, I would say. Uh, but before that, I would just like to say that Fulbright Scholarship Program um, started when, in 1945, Senator J. William Fulbright in introduced a bill in the United States Congress, and uh, uh, he wanted to use the sur sur surplus war property to fund the, and they say, promotion of international goods, uh, goodwill through exchange of students in the fields of education, culture, and science. And the next year, President Truman signed the bill into the law, and so the Fulbright program started. Um, 20 years later, 1964, Senator Fulbright came to Yugoslavia. Croatia was at that time part of the Yugoslavia. And that was the first socialist country, still not co co communist, but socialist at that point. The first socialist country that uh, actually um, signed the bilateral agreement of Fulbright scholarship with US. So it, it has a huge importance for our history. And then uh, we had a homeland war in 1990s, and the first bilateral agreement between now the independent states of Croatia and the US was the Fulbright Award program that was signed in 1992. So it, it, it has a weight, the program has a weight um, here in uh, Croatia as, as well. Um, so I would like just to start to explain uh, what I said I would do with my research and then just to walk you a bit through the process of research and actually what I've managed to do. But this is not really an in-depth um, um, uh, view because because of the time that, that we have. So on the right side of the screen, there's a building of the National and University Library in Zagreb, where I work in a, a manuscript division. And uh, I must say that um, in Croatia, there's... I'm, uh, the, the division between scholarship and practice, um, because of I primarily identify myself as practitioner and then as a researcher, uh, it's not so uh, visible as I saw it in the U.S. So that surprised me, I might say. Uh, but all of my thinkings really they come out of the practice because I really I try to see an issue when I see an issue I, I don't mean necessarily a problem, just a topic of interest, just something that is. Uh, interesting to think more about. Uh, I see a problem in, in, in a practice. I like to mm, see what uh, theory will tell about us about that, what can we research about that, and I like to put that back to practice to see does it work. So this is really basics for, for me. Um, the other uh, motivation was um, we have impression here that American uh, culture is really open, meaning institutional culture. And I would say that is probably connected with the long culture of democracy that you have when we have in like in the last 30 years. Uh, and that impression changed a bit during my stay, but still uh, not, not so much as I would say uh, that we have a um, openness of uh, institutional culture here. And lastly, why research about diaspora and migration? Because in my opinion, that's uh, one of the most com complex issues in archival and heritage practice, at least from the perspective of countries that have large diasporas. I mean, um, there is a popular view, and we are not far from the truth, that as many Croats live in Croatia, as many of those live outside Croatia. So we are talking just about 4 million people in the country and 4 million people in diaspora. And we nurture typical Eastern European view on diaspora members, inclusion based on so-called blood connection, right? Uh, but in order to understand their heritage or their descendants uh, and practices and see how can we use that culture as a way of connecting, not division, uh, that research really had to be done in 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 diaspora context, right? So. This is my motivation, and I clearly stated that uh, during my uh, application process. So how did it start? It? As you can see, to pass through all of this procedure, it takes, for me, it took around one year. I sent online application in June 2021, and after that, I got the first information in September 2021, uh, just saying that I've been considered as one of the final 
candidates. Uh, then we had interview via Zoom in October 2021 and final de decision in May 2022. I started program in September 2022 and finished in April this, this year. That program is really clear and straightforward guidance. It is really easy to apply and go through the process. And I just might say, my, I must say that part of the Fulbright Scholarship for Scholars, there is a Humphrey Award, which is intended for international practitioners, which is also great, you know, because you don't need to have PhD to, <coughs> to go to um, United States or from United States to come to the rest of the world, depending on which countries the US has the, uh, the agreement with, right? Um, and for us scholars that we go to US, we have to pass all procedures in English language. I'm not sure about the language sufficiency of the US candidates, uh, but I have met scholars from US that came as the Fulbright scholars in Croatia without any language skills. So I just think that this is that, that is connected with the host in institutions and their need, right? So uh, really easy process, uh, so nothing to worry about. Um, Su successful candidate. So my impression, and I must say that I can't be completely wrong, but my impression was that 60% uh, 60, 60 is the research proposal. Or if you're applying for a Humphrey, then uh, a project proposal, what would you like to do, why, how, how many times, you know, based, really, really based. Um, I'll return to, to the research proposal a little bit later, but uh, let me just uh, mention other documentation that I needed. Of course, passport, visa. Uh, we had non-visa agreement with US, but only for tourists, right? And this is business visa and health insurance is depending on that. So you need a visa, which is not a problem. And notarized the degree, which is also really easy to get. Then um, the candidate needs the letter of support from the home institutions, basically saying that they're okay and encourage your applications to the program. So nothing more. Um, one needs the invitation letter of the host institution from the country where would like we like to go. In our, if I were to do it again in our field of information studies. I would look for an institution that has ongoing project or program where I could be useful for them. That would be my first target, right? After that, three letters of recommendation from peers, former advisors, scholars, practitioners. Uh, they don't need to come from US or even that host country that you're applying to go. So just a person who can vouch for, for your uh, professional and academic achievements. Of course, detailed CV with previous achievements. And um, my impression that in my case, at least, the committee evaluated the bilateral importance of the research proposal. Uh, from US perspective, I can imagine that diaspora isn't such a huge topic, but from Croatia perspective, that's not only so societal and cultural, but also political and economical issue. Um, and also finally, I think that um, everybody involved in the process, both co committee members and the candidate, they have the same questions, what next, right? How will the candidate contribute back to the home country with that new knowledge and experience? And this, this is also something that the um, person has to think about. Um, regarding the research proposal that I mentioned, there are clear guidance how to sh how uh, this proposal should be structured. Um, so basically, include the objective and activities of the project, theoretical background, methodology, explain the significance and significance of the proposed research project and explain why you want to go specifically to that host in institution, not some other, right? So this is clearly structured, but only five single space pages of the document, not more. Uh, I applied also for uh, not just re research, but research and teaching. So I need to have um, a course syllabus also prepared, but this is also a document of five pages. So it is it is, it is really doable, I would say. Uh, so my project, and I have here um, 
um, I took the research proposal and during this short time, I will read just a bit of it so you can see it's basically a classical <laughs> research proposal, nothing, no, nothing more. <coughs> so my project was research and teaching, archival documentation of diasporic creation uh, community experiences. Um, the research was identifying and uh, analyzing archival and other material traces of the Croatian diaspora in San Pedro and Los Angeles. And the course that I taught at UCLA was transnational archival documentation of diasporic community experiences. So not only Croatian, but diaspora, global diaspora in uh, general. <laughs> we, we went with that, that was different story and we, as students were really great and I really loved to do it but we couldn't go much in depth because of the, you know it's a selective course so um but that was interesting this is the um, um flyer for the course so um when I came to UCLA uh they have uh they treated me as an uh, their employee so I had to pass all the procedures of the UCLA like uh all the um, which is i know for us context it's okay but we still in croatia we don't have that like you have to pass the um, uh, uh, sexual abuse uh, class then the security class then uh, um, uh, safety at work then you know like <laughs> sorry as regular em employee would would have to pass and i presume this is the same for us candidates coming to uh, other countries but uh, if you come to Croatia you will not have procedures like this but that was really interesting for me because I didn't have that ex experience before one of that was to prepare the course syllabus according to US standards which are ex especially UCLA which are really much higher than, than we have home so um, um, but I really loved it all, and students were really, really <laughs> great uh, people. People, right? Um, so this this is the flyer. Uh, but I'm going to more focus now on the research because I want to show you just in brief traces what I've been able to do. So I had to state <coughs> clear of objectives, as you can see, identifying and uh, analyze documentary and archival traces of Croatian diaspora in Los Angeles area. Documentary heritage uh, we use here in this part of Europe, UNESCO term, and this is different from arch archival heritage. Um, also, uh, number two, to make recommendation to preserve those traces and increase their accessibility for a range of audiences, which is closely connected to my work in the library also and to investigate the relations of that heritage and Croatian heritage in general um, with uh, within the community of diaspora uh, uh, people in the in the Los Angeles. Uh, so let me just see, okay, this is the map. Um, see, from Croatia to different stages of the, we had six huge, six huge waves of uh, emigration. Um, I don't count Europe into that because this is the migration all 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 the time from the Middle Age and Roman Age actually. But let's say in United States, um, one of the first settlements was in fact on West Coast, San Pedro and San Francisco. We had in 1840s San Francisco uh, Croatian community living there. Uh, they came in boats because the mostly men uh, went from Dalmatia which was not part of the Croatia. Croatia didn't e exist at that point as a country, an independent country. Uh, so they uh, took sailboats um, as fishermen and sailors and all around the horn they went to the to the west coast because the climate was similar. That people asked me that why didn't they go to the east coast? Because those men were living in Dalmatia and it's always sunny and 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 uh, uh, palm trees and sea and they needed the same actually um con conditions which they found in, in, in San Pedro also. <laughs> um so uh, now I'm reading from my proposal since the creation community of San Pedro is one of the oldest in terms of settlement in Southern California, it is internal to, to the societal fabric of the state and the country. 
how much of their past in terms of material and documentary heritage have been preserved in public institutions or private holding. For example, in the 19th century, newspapers were the prim primary medium of communication and carried messages to com communities abroad or to those back home, conveying the information and impressions from both ends. As such, we can find a lot of data about early immigrants to the USA in the newspapers preserved today in Croatia that might also be valuable for their, their descendants nowadays living in the USA, as well for institutions in Croatia that collect such information. To what extent is that material visible and accessible in public institutions around San Pedro and Los Angeles, how it is described <laughs> also? Uh, the online catalog entries of Californian institutions reveal the existence of such material, but since it's mostly not digitized, researchers can't access the content remotely. Moreover, um, much of the material prior to 1990s is cataloged under Yugoslav or Austro-Hungarian as main heading due to the political status of Croatia at that, at that time. Uh, have such material cultural traces contributed to the sustaining of creation identity of generations of nat naturalized Americans? And if so, what does the, this identity have in the lives, what, what role does this identity have in the lives of successive generations? Um, these questions remain under research in archival studies as well as in library and information studies uh, and necessitates, necessitates various methodological approaches. San Pedro in particular has been chosen because it was one of the first settlement places of Dalmatians in America. Its, its geographic footprint is well defined and it hasn't yet been studied. So this research will result in new data and information that should be of interest to scholars and institutions in both Southern California and Croatia, as well as to migration and diaspora scholars uh, more generally. So this was from the uh, my uh, research proposal. So you can see it's just basically stating what, uh, why, uh, in what geographical and time area, and the Im importance of of um, uh, such. Uh, let me just say, uh, okay. Let me just still here. So. I would just, because this is something that my students didn't, of course, they didn't know why should they know that it's, it's nothing that is, uh, can be used in their daily life so far now. But for our perspective of creation, this is important. Why? Because um, everything is regulated uh, within the civil law countries, as Croatia is, everything is regulated. We have acts on museums, acts on archives, acts on libraries, specific plans that are uh, specific, Specifying, right? Uh, what the library, what national library should do, what state archive should do, and it's in the those acts that the, it said, library and archives should collect information about Croats living abroad. They should document their diaspora. They should collect uh, material or digitized copies. We have huge fund of the personal papers that people who died in the United States shipped with the ship to us, right? But in my opinion, this is this is quite a shared heritage because that material actually was created in the United States. If that were some other European country with a, uh, um, strict and rigid heritage law, it would be even uh, illegal to export the cultural goods out of the country, you know, but this was not classified as cultural good in the US. So it's a matter of personal will where to left where, where to leave its uh, personal papers but it it we have a collection that is called foreign Croatica, but it's not the uh, the uh, typical just for us all eastern european especially in eastern european countries have it uh foreign hungarica Poland also has it Poland also has an institute that specifies is especially with the uh, diaspora and the Polish people living abroad, which is really interesting also. We don't have an um, institute as such, but we do have the Central State Office for Croats Abroad. We also have ACT, ACT it's called ACT on Relation of the Republic of Croatia with Croats Abroad, and government body that is, has to uh, um, deal with the um, um, promotion of re relations between people living in Croatia and Croats Abroad. So my point is that the uh, 
we think about diaspora members as uh, also as Croat people. They're, they're just living outside Croatia, even though they might be the fifth generation. This is the perspective of the country that has a huge immigration past and not many experience with immigration flow. The US, of course, is, is, quite, is quite differently. Um, also, our diaspora has the voting rights. So it is also a political question, it's economical question also, because of the huge remittances that we got <laughs> after the, during the course of the history, I, I would say. Uh, so um, records and archival concerns about diaspora, from my per perspective, of course, gene genealogical and family research, uh, records of American citizens uh, that are needed uh, to get the Croatian uh, uh, citizenship, right? But remember, we have different record cultures, completely different. And it's not easy for a person from US uh, coming here to Croatia, trying to find, um, I don't know, vital records of the mother or grandmother, or, right? It's difficult. Also, we have inheritance laws that says that the people, descendants of uh, 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 land ownership of land, land owners, uh, they can inherit the uh, land here in Croatia. So we need records for that. Uh, as I said, we have many acts on this and that. Huh? So legal requirements, meaning our institutions need to collect this information. Uh, from our per perspective, the uh, relations with Croat support is a matter of cultural, national, and linguistic identity, meaning the nation as a whole, right? And all the cultural remittances, patrimony and cultural heritage, also the heritage that is created by Croats abroad is a, is a Croatian heritage. And this is the problem with migration research, because I situated this project as on the, between um, migration studies, archival studies, and on anthropology and what surprised me the most was the um, each discipline looks only from its own perspective and uh, only from one angle meaning Im immigration or emigration you know there are not so many projects that try to do both actually right <laughs> but i mean we have to because we we share that from our perspective we share that material with with others so this is Interesting. So let me just go through example that I think is uh, would be. Um, <clears throat> so I work in I work in a library, right? And I, uh, my colleague gave me these newspapers. The New Herald is written in Croatian, but also in English. It was published in San Pedro in 1922. We have only like five issues here, one, two, three, five, from 1992, second year. And he asked me, oh, do you have time? Would you like just to find the rest? Because we need to digitize all, digitize all. I mean, how do you mean we need digitize all? Because it's not in, it's not situated. The newspapers are not in the Croatia. So how, find a way. So I was trying to find a way to, to uh, gather information about these newspapers. E exactly. Um, <clears throat> so the man came from the then Yugoslavia, but he was a Serb. So it's a different et ethnicity as I understood the race uh, um, topic uh, would be parallel to our et ethnicity topic. And that is something that my US colleagues were really surprised to talk with me about that. But this is just how it, because of different traditions, right? And um, um, okay, it was printed in St. Pedro. And then the man from St. Pedro transferred the um, uh, publishing office into Los Angeles to. Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> but the thing is that the man was born as a Serb. So because Croatian diaspora is uh, blood connected, should be, uh, uh, it will be really hard to connect that enterprise and him with a uh, descendant of a, of a um, um, Croat person or to say, to, to be able to prove that he shares the same identity. That that is also an open topic. I know it sounds completely strange to you. I'm completely aware of that, but it, this is still an open topic for us, right? The other thing, it is written in uh, Croatian language, so it will fit into foreign Croatic collections. Fine. Um, I haven't been able to trace any of it anywhere. Uh, people from San Pedro didn't know that it was ever published in San Pedro. 
and they're lovely, lovely people there in uh, working in the uh, historical society. Um, they were really happy to learn about it, right? Because it's part of their local history. They had a printing office in a small town at that time. Now San Pedro is part of LA, but at that time it was the separate, uh, maybe, not, but yeah, a uh, little, little town. So uh, it, this is labeled as immigrant or ethnic press with you guys and with us is immigrant and diaspora press. And I can't understand why don't we look at the one whole. But that's okay. Uh, uh, we have that one copy, and um, uh, we will continue to search for more. But um, some periodicals, print in general, that were published by the Croatian community in the USA were censored by the Austro-Hungarian government. That was until the 1918, right? And permission to dis dispatch them and send them by post was restricted if not this disabled. Usual accusation at that point of history is that that Croatian American press was too socialist in political orientation and therefore can't be sold or dispatched in Austro-Hungary. After the Second World War, we also had the censorship and communist re uh, regime also uh, um, uh, had acts on censorship of different kind, but that press was deemed as too nationalistic to be this dispatch. So also poor, pre, completely prohibited. Uh, we only have records. Some of them are in Vienna because some of them in Croatia. That's quite normal. We have records about in in all Europe, depending on the um, who was the body in charge of the of the censorship. And uh, but we only know that, that these newspapers were censored. We don't have actually copies. Copies are in the USA or in the country who printed. So this is really interesting. And if you think about, we had what well, I said, 1860s until 1989, we had different censorship laws in Cro Croatia. So that's really yeah. That's that. Uh, and then you have to only way to trace those print books, newspapers, whatever, is through through records. So this is, I think, really, really, really interesting. Uh, we need to keep in mind that cultural traces and material and immaterial heritage created by the diasporic community in the host country are also part of its cultural landscape, intertwined it's in societal and cultural fabric. That perspective is often overlooked by homeland research. Since we don't know what is in fact preserved in the first place, it's impossible to contemplate what is missing from the inform informational na narratives and why. This is also something that they were written in the research pro proposal. Uh, so, um, for our concerns from archives per perspectives, uh, what role should cultural heritage institutions play in creating and preserving transnational archival documentation relation, uh, related to migration and diaspora? Uh, why are diaspora and diasporic heritage important for countries? I've written East Europe <laughs> because I come from that space, but in general. And how uh, is the research about diaspora usually positioned, meaning one one way or the other, not not the not, not the whole way? So this is one part. Let me just check. Ellen, how much time do I have? You're doing fine. We have about 10 more minutes for Excellent. your presentation. Excellent. So I will just I will just walk you through um, the other part because I was looking into the uh and I had the this is all this was really my advantage because of my knowledge of the language and as I said, blood connection, although we are not relatives, but people from uh, that are part of the uh, uh, Croatia, um, Croatian diaspora um, uh, accepted me as, a, I wouldn't say they're their, their, their member, no, but as a person who is allowed to enter that community spaces. And I really am thankful for that. Um, so one of the, uh, so San Pedro, right, the, on the um, south of Los Angeles, between the, uh, on the harbor, it's a, it's a Los Angeles harbor also, um, on one side the, is the Long Beach, and then the, on the other, 
Palo, Palo Verdes, uh, uh, really interesting place. And when you walk there, I will just um, walk you through Sif Lavkos, this harbor poultry, that's creation name. Um, I looked at those memories that are preserved in public spaces, so not just town or city, but also the community records, the archives, uh, com community archives. In fact, we will classify those here as private archives because we have like legislation that says that you have to classify that as a private archive, which is also interesting. That's interesting for my US colleagues. Um, uh, how is called community memory represented in those places? Uh, is there any presence in local cultural in institutions? And what about community clubs, uh, association, and centers? So when you walk to around San Pedro, you see there is a creation place. Uh, they believe nowadays, uh, and I'm not sure about the number because mm, each statistic gives different, but uh, 35,000 people living in that and that would say that uh, they are of Croatian heritage uh, live, live in that in that area. That's why you have a Croatian place, a little street that it's named Croatian place because they used to live here uh, mostly as a community in the, in the past. Ante Perkove, also one of the men that came to San Pedro, Bogdanovic Recreation Center. Martin Bogdanovic, he was a huge figure in San Pedro. Uh, one of the men who founded the Star Tuna Star Kiss Company, right? So he has his own recreation center, right? Yeah, um, Creation Cultural Center of Greater Los Angeles, which was opened in 2001 and closed in 2017. That's a whole different story. Uh, you have Dalmatian American Club, which was in fact Yugoslav Club, founded in 1928. They have also their archives. Creation American Hall, uh, in 1950, founded by men who came, um, several men who came from Dalmatia. Also, they also have their own little. Okay. Neither of them would call that archive because why? Because uh, archival culture is not part of the cultural tra tradition in Croatia. You know, they are more oriented to song, dance, and folklore. Let's say like that. Uh, uh, historical societies were not think in Croatia. Never, they were thinking in England, but not, but not in, in in Croatia. And there are community members that hold to belongings of their great grandfathers, grandfathers. Uh, they keep the material that their ancestors brought with themselves from the here from the homeland. Some of the members even sent back some of the material to be preserved in our mu museums here because they thought it's, mm, I don't know, more valued, I would say, here uh, also. Uh, there is a San Pedro Historical Society. There's, they're excellent, really, really uh, nice group of uh, heritage enthusiasts, I would say. They have a huge, they have a huge archive. <laughs> They're classified as ethnic ethnics. One of the ethnics were Yugoslavs. Um, but that uh, um, um, changes changes happened after the 1990s. Uh, Croatia became uh, independent, but that's a whole different and really complex story. I will not go into that detail. Uh, but there are few, if not any members of Croatian uh, uh, descendants in that society because. They prefer the song and dance as cultural expressions, not the collecting and um, memorizing in this in this uh, aspect, right? Uh, they have material in written in Croatian language, so can't be cataloged, of course, because of the lack of the uh, knowledge skills. So um, I would say that um, in from aspect of migration diaspora that. Um, that records reveal data about past migration, um, and they actually should guide us uh, in collecting policies and uh, representation policies, description in future. Uh, they're important both for com and, and host country, for individual and communities, and for research purposes, if you want secondary pur purposes. But they are challenging also from per perspective of cultural institution practices re researchers because of all the complex uh, <laughs> around them. And um, for me, it was uh, really um, interesting to see how this course of migration in the American 
call a literature, maybe I'm wrong in my impression that change uh, authors from 1960s and 70s talked about naturalization and assimilation, then the word uh, world word integration and social co co cohesion came to play, then mul multicultural, uh, and then uh, uh, diversity. We didn't pass through that changes. You know, we are still somewhere in the talking about the integration because we are immigrant culture, culture not immigrant, but we are having more and more uh, uh, immigrant uh, uh, community coming to the Croatia because of the war on the Middle East and you, Ukraine and uh, our institutions and society uh, uh, needs to learn how to how to ac accept it and um, uh, how to um, conduct toward this topic issue not 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 a problem but a new state i would say right and um, regarding the culture and um, differences so this is uh, something that I noticed in Los Angeles, this is the research focus, in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, but social justice, race, ethnicity, gender, colonialism, oppression, community, archive movement, and relations of power that have been an issue in the last 20 years. Um, I had a really interesting uh, talk about uh, uh, how also we in Europe should decolonize our um, archival practices, which is, uh, of, of course, something that is really um, urgent to think about. But um, there are 40, 44 countries in Europe, 12 were colonial power. We were never part of that discourse in the past. So it's really hard to talk about decolonization of the practice that, of a country that was really never a colonial power at, at all. It's not, it, we see it in practice and in, in theory here as a really important issue globally, of course, globally. But our contribution to that uh, narrative is not something that we can really contribute. You know? but to the issues of uh, ethnicity and gender and the community archive movement, of course, you know, there is something that we also have, but just call it different in different names, you know. And uh, from the perspective of the Croatia, the hot topics, I would say, still are the digital tra transformation, which is closely connected with European Union goals of the digital transformation of society, meaning that funding is also driving the research. Uh, also, uh, migration as an issue still it's really it's really um, uh, being uh, uh, considered as a topic that is worth uh, re research more. Um, and I wouldn't say um, uh, that our practice or scholar views will uh, are completely different, but they do reside on different traditions, you know, and uh, I think that we need to critically e examine them, not just try to, um, how to say, mirror the same, the same issues or the same answers. And migration and diaspora is a good e example, in my opinion, right, to talk about that. Oh, if you go to Fulmer program or Humphrey, uh, there are great uh, hosts there. So um, on the upper right picture, we are at the uh, food bank. We were volunteers for a day, you know, trying to help with the di distribution of food, which was amazing. On the left picture, I really had, <laughs> this was a, uh excellent opportunity. I also was a volunteer in setting up the veteran archive in the Los Angeles. And on the right, on the bottom picture, that's me helping the fellow researcher. To, she wanted to <coughs> measure my brain wave. So it's, it's a fun picture. So that's why I put it. Uh, but most of all, and I'm not sure who is still here with us and listening, I have to say that I wouldn't be able to do any of this without the colleagues, not just friends, but colleagues uh, that became friends. So I'm, I'm not sure if Michelle Frick is here. And she's an amazing business. Uh, our uh, archive person from business archives, you know, and uh, she really had a, a patience with me to uh, talk me, you know, this is how we do it. This is a, so thank you so much, Michelle and um, uh, Professor Anne Gilliland without her, you know, but she really does a lot of uh, international work. So I think that people around the world should be <laughs> grateful for, to her for her, her, gui her guidance. Uh, and I met some really, really interesting and nice people. And um, uh, if any of you consider to come to Croatia, or if I can help in any way, I'm really glad to do it. So this is for me. 
Thank you so much. That's just fascinating. And um, I love how you end on that high note of the personal professional relationships that you've made and those those various cultural and experiences that allowed you to contribute in other ways. Aside from this, this really important work you're doing on it's part of that critical analysis of, of global archives and how we have similarities and differences. And it's important to look closely at those and through that investigation benefit from that investigation. Thanks so much. I'm sure we have loads of questions, um, uh, either about your own research. Oh, yes. Yeah. We were gonna stop recording. Thank you so much. Um, we'll, we'll turn over to questions and answers now or discussion of any form. And for that purpose, we will stop recording.